কৌশিক কাউন্টডাউন স্টার্ট করছি হুম ভেরি গুড ইভিনিং টু অল I on behalf of Institute of Palmo Care and Research cordially invite you to the 10th session of PalmoCon 2021. Today we will discuss a case based approach about severe asthma. To chair the session I would like to invite Dr. Ajoy Sharkar. Dr. Sharkar is a renowned pulmonologist and intensivist. His primary areas of interest are sepsis and related complications, pleural diseases, sleep related diseases. an atypical microbacterial infection he has served as a national faculty in indian chest society of critical care medicine and also forms as a chairman of organizing committees of imaging in critical care 2050 he has a number of publications in national and international journals to his credit currently he is associated with peerless hospital kolkata i i welcome you sir and request you to kindly proceed over today's session thank you thank you and welcome to everybody to this webinar session on severe asthma uh, all you know that uh, severe asthma is a disease where there are lot of confusions but the consensus definition as it stands today is a the patient who had been on high dose of inhaled steroid plus laba long acting beta agonist and also leukotriene modifier and theophylline plus or they had been on systemic steroid for more than one year at least 50% times of the last previous years so these are the group of patients we call them as severe asthma and it's a heterogeneous group of populations because they vary their response to treatment varies quite significantly and with this few uh, <clears throat> with this problem we are going to discuss today severe asthma on a case based basis and we have a very re renowned and distinguished speaker one is uh, dr indranil halda is a renowned teacher and consultant pulmonologist and a national faculty he is currently assist, assistant professor in the department of pulmonary medicine kullani hospital and he has also got number of publications in different national and international journals on his credit he is going to talk a case case uh, or deliver a case which so uh, simulates like asthma but actually it's not an asthma on the other hand we have got another speaker very eminent and distinguished speaker dr sumit sengupta he is currently senior consultant in amri hospital <coughs> salt lake his specialties include pulmonary respiratory medicine sleep lung transplant allergy and immunology he has several publications in national and international journals in his credit he is as i mentioned he is associated with amri and fortis hospital and uh, sumit i would also like uh, to add one thing that sumit has got a vast experience in uk and he worked in a center uh, normally we used to refer all the complicated cases in papuat and cambridge rotation he did that uh, rotation so he has got a uh, extensive uh, <clears throat> experience in serious pulmonary problem so sumit is going to talk on asthma it obviously case based uh, asthma which actually could be anything but it they are really asthma and their response to treatment varies so probably he is going to highlight the best way of treating those group of patients with this few word i like to invite first dr indranil halda to deliver his lecture first dr halder so uh, thank you uh, dr sarkar and dr watchaj for giving me the invitation uh, to be a part of the palmocon program and today uh, in the next two cases that will be delivering the first case of severe asthma in fact it has already been discussed what this severe asthma is so it's a subset of the 
difficult to treat asthma, where it means that it is uncontrolled despite the adherence and maximum optimal therapy and treatment of the say comorbidities and co uh, that is confounding factors or that worsens even when high dose is just decreased from the higher dose of steroid. So it's basically a retrospective level. It is sometimes also called severe re refractory asthma since it is defined by the relatively refractory to the high dose of the inhaled therapy. But with the advent of biologics now, the word refractory is sometimes no longer used. So they start with a case with a 55 years gentleman presenting with shortness of breath, which had a seasonal train initially, but later on it became persistent shortness of breath. The person also had cough, mucoid expectoration off and on, wheezing, but he never smoked in his lifetime. So coming to the patient when he presented to us, he was having increased symptoms despite the high dose of inhaled corticosteroid along with a long-acting beta-2 agonist that was, he was on salmeterol 48 micrograms and fluticasone 2000 micrograms, which was in the criteria of very high dose of inhaled corticosteroid. He was also added titropium, nine micrograms, twice two puffs. He used to need his rescue medication off and on with nocturnal awakening and nocturnal symptoms. He was even symptomatic on minimal exertion, taking his daily day-to-day -day activities. And in the past year, he required three short course of oral steroids. So if you see, all these are representing that the person is poorly controlled. And definitely by this time, since he has visited a number of physicians, he was reviewed a number of times. He was taken, he was taken to granted that he was having his adherence, he was having his uh, medications in the best of its way. So his adherence to medication was definitely confirmed. So with this, the patient was examined. He had bilateral ronchi and other system examination, which we did or put within normal limit. And the first thing, while we examine a patient of asthma, suspected asthma in that way you call it, or an obstructive lung disease, the first thing that we think of and we try to see is two important things. In fact, this pyrometry, and definitely also you go for a chest X-ray to see whether it is something other than that or whether there are some other uh, manifestations in the chest. So the first thing that we see is this pyrometry. And if we look at this two cuff, flow volume and the volume time, it clearly tells us that the subject is having severe obstruction. And if we go to the absolute value, you can see from this that the subject is having severe obstruction with FEV147 and the reversibility is not up to that. We can tell that it was very good reversible bronchial reversibility because it was less than 200 milliliters and it is not fulfilling the criteria of 12% change, but, but it's, there is reversibility and the subject was having uh, severe obstruction. So with this, definitely the next thing that we go for is a chest X-ray. The chest X-ray, except a few nodules, small nodules that we see here are basically, is basically normal. And that is, there is no features of even the hyperinflation. In fact, the diaphragms are also normal. So the chest X-ray was essentially normal. So this was the thing that we were dealing with, but we were just puzzled to see why this subject is having severe asthma or difficult to treat asthma in spite of his good adherence. So one thing initially what we missed is his blood report. So this is very important. And once we got the blood report, we saw that the total count, leukocyte count was 8,500. And he had a very high eosinophil level to the tune of 55%. His hemoglobin was normal. Ig at that time was 250. And other blood parameters like the liver function, renal function was uh, normal. Allergy panel, in fact, blood analgy panel in, in the uh, immunocap method was done and a specific Ig showed raised to cockroach danger. So the thing that now comes to our mind is that we were thinking that the patient was having difficult to treat asthma or a severe asthma patient, though he had all other uh, features, the comorbidities were excluded and other things were excluded. But with this, we have that his a eosinophil count was very high. In fact, 
we tried to search for other previous eosinophil count and six months back, that also here the eosinophil count was very high with a total count of 11,600. His eosinophil count was 36%. So in fact, it was of long duration and six months back, a, a blood report also showed that the eosinophil count was 36. So the next thing with that chest X-ray, we advised a CT scan because again, to think of a differential, we normally, a patient who is having pulmonary symptoms with blood eosinophilia, the first thing that we try to narrow down our differentials in different ways, one of the simplest way as a pulmonologist, we do is to find whether the eosinophilia is with pulmonary infiltrates or not. So again, we'll come to that, how we can narrow down our differentials. And the first thing that we advise after this is to do a high resolution CT scan. And if you see the CT scan, I'm showing only a few cuts of the patients. It was not that abnormality that we could find and the CT scan was also essentially normal. So with this, what we could think of is a patient of airflow obstruction, that is obstructive airway disease with eosinophilia. That's the thing. So initially, though we thought that this was asthma, a poorly controlled asthma or difficult to treat asthma, but ultimately it turned out to be something other than or with asthma with some other morbidities. So when we think of this patient, the next thing that we should do, or we did it for this patient was to review of the previous records to find out what was uh, the cause of this eosinophilia. So other symptoms of say collagen vascular disease was also taken off. No record of any joint pain, no record of any neurological involvement or cardiological symptoms. Because again, why was this important? Because when you think of eosinophilia, we have to see whether there were some end organ damage, mainly the cardiac patients. Symptoms of reflux was there. The chest X-ray, previous chest X-ray was also taken out and that was normal. Blood Ig, serum Ig was less than 200. Eosinophil varied in different times in different range from 20 to 40 percent. In fact, if we had uh, we had seen the serial spirometry for the last two years that we could get, there was a gradual deterioration of the lung function. With this differential diagnosis that we could think of, and in fact, uh, I would ask my moderator to interfere here. What we thought of at that time, where whether you are dealing with a severe eosinophilic asthma, that is a patient of poorly controlled or difficult to treat asthma who had severe eosinophil, and that is the patients who are then thought of to be put on biologics and newer drugs, newer medications, which my next speaker probably will be elaborating on that, or of hyper eosinophilia of undetermined significance, the other differential that we thought of, topical pulmonary eosinophilia, hyper eosinophilic syndrome, hyper eosinophilic eosinophilia, leukemia, or sometimes familial hyper eosinophilia is a somewhat presentation in this type where we took take of the family history. So with this, uh, should I? Uh, yeah. So any obviously you have raised a question that are we dealing with really asthma or it's asthma-like presentations, but the disease is something else. And probably the if you go back and you have taken the previous history as well, which indicates that he had been on high eosinophilic count for quite a long time. And uh, you haven't mentioned about the duration of asthma. So if the duration of asthma had been for prolonged period, then I would go more in favor of severe eosinophilic asthma. And also I like to know the sputum uh, eosinophil count as well at that point. But if the history was limited, not more than one or two years, and he had been on this count, eosinophil count for a prolonged period, then probably we are dealing with two things. One is hyper eosinophilia of undetermined significance or hyper eosinophilic syndrome. But hyper eosinophilic syndrome, as you have mentioned, that always do have some organ involvement of which most important is uh, cardiac and also they have the GI symptoms involvement, so, and neurology. So obviously you have taken that history. 
And I don't think tropical eosinophilia is a, uh, will come here. A hyper eosinophilic leukemia is a very um, uh, serious leukemia. Probably they don't survive for long. So that probably rules out without treatment. And uh, familial hyper is, yes, a possibility. But uh, again, the history and the other the members of the family are affected or not will differentiate that. That's my take from this. So thank you, sir. With this, just to, uh, we can progress a bit. And in fact, when we see this kind uh, of hyper definitely just to go a bit of theoretical and uh, discussion about it, it may be uh, primary hyper which is called the clonal expansion or it may be due to secondary, secondary may be due to infection, due to atopy, which we really are interested as a pulmonologist, which include allergic rhinitis, asthma. Some of the medication, so a medication history is very important. GI diseases like irritable bowel syndrome or esophageal, uh, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis is important and issue. Lymphocytic, like aberrant lymphocyte clone, immunodeficiency, rheumatological, definitely, EGPA, SLE, dermatomyositis, and inflammatory arthritis comes and others, adrenal insufficiency, duct versus source disease, solid organ transplant, sickle cell are in the differential. So with this, we went for further investigations to find out our, or narrow down our differentials in that way. So further investigations in tropical countries, definitely stool pores parasite is to be seen because the helminthic infection is to be ruled out, but with this tune of hyper for prolonged period, it is unlikely that it is because of some parasitic infection, but still stool force parasite was normal. Firelial antigen was negative. In fact, vasculitis workup is very important to find out other uh, intrinsic causes, which include Cianca, Pianca, which were all negative. ABPA is an important uh, exclusion. Though the CT scan was normal, absolutely normal, but allergy, aspergillus, serology, precipitin was negative. HIV is another important issue where we find pulmonary infiltrates with eosinophilia that was also negative. Drug history was specifically taken, uh, which was also negative. CTPNS was also normal. So whatever workup we could do in our setting, we have done it and have seen that these were all negative. Then we consulted an hematologist and we went for a bone marrow. So though it's not our expertise, but this bone, bone marrow, what the hematologist reported was uh, because of say reactive um, uh, hyperplasia without any clonal proliferation. So leukemia or some other form of eosinophilic leukemia, though it may be any other forms of leukemia was practically not thought of. And again, the hematologist ordered for some other investigations, which include this all panel, which they normally do to rule out eosinophilic leukemia, AML or CML or acute or any chronic leukemia, is the PG, uh, PGDFRA, the other, the FIP1L1 uh, mutation, and the JAK stat mutations, which are all negative, the T shell, uh, the colonity negativity, TCR rearrangement negativity, a CT abdomen and pelvis was also done, and that was also negative. So with this, just to have some review of literature, when we see a eosinophilia, and if we go by the WHO definitions of eosinophilic disorders, which was updated in 2020, it may be non-hematological, which is secondary or reactive, or hematological, which is primary or the clonal disorder where there is potential for an end organ damage. And by definition, hyper eosinophilia has been defined as a peripheral blood eosinophil count of more than 1.5 into 10 to the power 9 per liters. And with this, the few other differentials with this hyper eosinophilia comes as idiopathic eosinophilia, where the eosinophil count ranges below 1,500, but more than 50, 500. That is hyper, this is idiopathic eosinophilia, the hyper eosinophilia, where the eosinophil count is more than 1,500 for four weeks. Previously, it was more and some other literature showed more than 5,000 for more than six months. And hyper eosinophilic syndrome, where syndrome means there is end organ damage with an eosinophil count of more than 1,500. That is high. The other is hyper eosinophilia of undetermined significance, which is known as HEUS, 
where the eosinophil count is more than 1500 without end organ damage and where no other cause is defined or identified and hyper eosinophilic syndrome idiopathic where there is end organ damage and cause is not found out and the eosinophil count is more than 1500. So if you consider this all criteria, our case ideally fits into the third group that is hyper eosinophilia of undetermined significance. So, uh, and uh, should we stop here, Cam? And may I ask our uh, moderator to just comment on what we thought, whether we should do more or uh, anything more than that? I have just uh, said that there are three possibilities from the previous slide. So it seems that the, there is no organ involvement in this case, other organ involvement. And the only organ is involved is pulmonary, uh, which is probably uh, hyper eosinophilia in undetermined significance could be a possibility, but I'm not sure whether they have mentioned that in that case, they can present like asthma or not. This entity, whether they will present like asthma or not. So that hasn't been mentioned. So what, what is your take? So in that case, we can see uh, normally hyper eosinophilic syndrome idiopathic, there is end organ damage and end organ damage in the form of asthma or shortness of breath, but the most common organ that is involved is the cardiac cardiac involvement, but our patient didn't probably present with some cardiac involvement. So yes, the differential can be hyper eosinophilia of undetermined significance or the hyper eosinophilic syndrome, idiopathic hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So the DD may, may be placed into either the hyper eosinophilia of undetermined significance or hyper eosinophilia e syndrome idiopathic because yes, there was some pulmonary symptoms. Yes, it's correct. So you, the patient was started on steroids one milligram per kg, the respiratory symptom reduced, but not elevated, eosinophil persist up to 30%, but he refused long-term steroid, steroid was tougher, and he was continued with the combination inhaler, but the symptoms, that is the poorly controlled asthma symptoms was controlled. So I just a bit of literature before uh, I can, uh, I'll be, we'll be discussing the case, just a blood and pulmonary eosinophilia. What we didn't did in the case, which Dr. Sharkar rightly pointed out, was that we didn't go for a bronchoscopy or what could have been done easily was an induced putam eosinophil count because we could have seen whether there was pulmonary eosinophilia was not or not. So pulmonary eosinophilia is a very important uh, uh, way that we could have dealt with whether the patient had pulmonary eosinophilia and that the simplest way that could be done in non-invasive way was to have an induced putam eosinophil. So we can then differentiate blood and pulmonary eosinophilia both in cases of low flush syndrome, parasitic, chronic uh, eosinophilic pneumonia, allergic, ABPA, EGPA, and hyper, uh, that is hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Isolated, whereas isolated pulmonary eosinophilia can be seen in acute eosinophilic pneumonia, medications, pneumocystitis carine pneumonia, boob, bronchiolitis, or, uh, obliterance organizing pneumonia, tuberculosis, and eosinophilic granuloma. So probably we can end up the case and we can have some discussion on this case in a patient who really presented with severe asthma, but ultimately it was something uh, other that we found out. Uh -huh. Probably there are a few issues we can discuss, but I, and since it's a, uh, your talk was on asthma-like presentation, but it was not asthma, but still we haven't uh, decided from that case that we, uh, we cannot completely rule out the eosinophilic asthma group, hyper eosinophilic asthma group, because we haven't done the sputum asthma level, we haven't done the other biomarkers like fractional excretion of nitric oxide and uh, with high eosinophil count and uh, eosinophilic infiltration, they can have this. So we'll discuss that uh, part later on. Let Dr. Sengupto present his case first and he is going to talk about a case which actually an asthma, but as he has rightly pointed out, we are discussing cases because as, asthma, but they are not responding to usual treatment. So severe asthma with the uh, standard treatment, they, they are re resistant. So obviously we have to go for other kind of treatment. Dr. Sengupta, please.
Unmute your mic. Sumit, unmute. Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening. Can you see that? Yeah. Good. Um, I was quite uh, listening with interest to Indonil's uh, uh, patient. And uh, I, uh, we will discuss a couple of things I thought we might have done in addition to what you were doing. But let me get on to the main topic today. Um, severe asthma and a case and a sort of a, a look through all the options. There are a huge number of options which have opened up nowadays and uh, a sort of an open-ended question at the end and what to do with my patient. Uh, and we will uh, get on with it right now. So the lady was 56, never smoker. Only three year history of shortness of breath and wheeze, three years only. Never had wheeze or allergic symptoms in the past. She was not housed as mite hypersensitive based on history. She had two hospital admissions for uh, asthma in the last year before she came to see me. This is in June of 2021, she came to see me first time. She was last three months on oral steroids. And the last time she'd had a PFT done, remember that the COVID has come in between, so probably she didn't have uh, very many things. When she was relatively stable, it was 0.97. She was much worse clinically when she came to see me and was not in a state to get a PFT done in my outpatient appointment. I, I discussed with her and I um, sort of got, uh, said that though she wasn't that hypoxic or anything, she was uh, maintaining her SATs, so we thought it'd be best to admit her for assessment, treatment, whatever, and get on with it. So we, so I admitted her. A eosinophil count on oral steroids was 716 and her IG was 192. This is on uh, prior to admission, she had the recent reports. So effectively, definition of severe asthma by Gina is uncontrolled despite optimized treatment with high dose or requires high dose to prevent it from uncontrolled. And uh, it's similar to the ERS, guide, ERS ATS guidelines um, uh, and or systemic corticosteroids. So she was definitely in the first instance, severe asthma. We, we will look at how this, this may not be a correct uh, estimation because there are a lot of, um, uh, let's say, operational issues which make people get onto oral, oral steroids. And one of the things probably was she, uh, uh, this was a COVID uh, times and so she probably wasn't following up as well as she should have done. Now, high dose inhaled steroids, what does that mean? I mean, you're, we all say if you are requiring high dose inhaled steroids and, you know, um, you have to define what that means. And essentially, both the GINA and the ERS ATS guidelines agree on, I'm sticking to budesonide so that it's easier, the, the equivalent dose is greater than or equal to 1600 micrograms per day. Greater than or equal to 1600 micrograms per day. GINA puts it in greater than 800, which is effectively the same thing. Uh, so... She was, uh, we'll see whether she was on that, but she was already on oral corticosteroids. So she fits the criteria for severe asthma uh, on the face of it, on, on the preliminary face of it. So this is what she was on when she got admitted. Inhaled formoterol budesonide by a DPI, uh, a synchrobid um, uh, uh, device, SOS levosalbutamol, oral visalone, ranging from between 30 to 10, depending on, you know, she used to take three or four days of 30 and then tail up, she was given a protocol for that, never less than 10 in the last three months. N-acetylcysteine, Montelukas, fexofenadine, that was more for uh, associated allergic rhinitis, uh, azithromycin, serotrodrast, which is a thromboxin uh, inhibitor, which uh, really doesn't have that much evidence to it, and esimeprazole, uh, presumably to, to uh, combat the associated uh, acid reflux disease. So this is what she was on. So she got admitted. We tailed off the oral stretch from 10, 7.55, 2.5 5 over a period of a week. And at this point of time, I, I had on a very high dose of nebulized budesonide, about 8 milligrams per day. And then we switched her to 
inhaled steroids via, uh, you know, uh, via spacer. And I observed her for 72 hours of oral steroids on inhaled steroids in hospital. So her discharge, pre-discharge FEV1 was 1.38. And uh, looking at what, what we had done differently, I had added on tiotopium, which wasn't there in the previous uh, setting. I had increased the formatoid of to 3,200 microgram per day. It's not milligram, it should be microgram uh, per day, but through an inhaler spacer, not a DPI device. And obviously we, we trained her thoroughly every day. A nurse would come and have a look at her. I doubled the Montelukas dose. I'd stop the vice loan, of, of course. I'd added on an anti-anxiety because it, it was a, it's a vicious cycle. You know that hyperventilation due to anxiety can actually precipitate asthma attacks and uh, play havoc with the patient's symptoms. I continued with the esomeprazole and I gave her an azelastin cuticus or nasal spray. I stopped the azithromycin. We will come to that later uh, because uh, of her IgE being raised and, uh, and her eosinophilia being there. And so this was... She was symptomatically, dramatically better. That FEV1 you see on the left side, 0.91 was almost five months earlier. She was probably much lower when she came in. We didn't do a, she wasn't able to do an FEV1 at the uh, initiation of our hospital admission. So that was a very good uh, situation, we thought. Now, uh, we, we kept her under close follow-up because I was a bit scared that we'd stop the steroids and she could go. And so within a week or two, we saw her twice. And I got her HRCT at this stage and a repeat IG two, three weeks after uh, stopping the oral steroids, which went up sharply to 792. Though it was not more than 1,000, which is our usual screening test for AVP, I send off an aspergillus IgE. That came at 1.95, as you know, point three, less than 0.35 is a, is a um, um, normal uh, sort of less than is considered normal. And so I will put it at query ABPA because the, the mandatory uh, uh, IgE more than 1,000 wasn't there. But of course, you have to remember this patient has been on three months of steroids. That may suppress the IgE. Um, so this was a situation in the outpatient. And we were quite happy that she was just on inhaled steroids and other inhalers and seemed to be doing well. After two months, I decreased the total budesonide dose to 1,600 micrograms. It wasn't just plain budesonide. Sorry, I, I make myself clear. It's formoterol budesonide. So, but the uh, effective budesonide dose was decreased to 1600. A couple of weeks down the line, from 1.38, if you remember on discharge, FEV1 decreased to 0.87 sharply. So, two, three weeks down the line. Immediately, we increased the dose to 3600 microgram per day. Another couple of weeks down the line, FEV1 increased to 1.57. So she is very steroid, inhaled steroid dependent, but at a level which is not very comfortable, though she is, um, uh, we will look into that. And so that was her um, 13th August was 0.87 FEV1 and 31st August, just by changing the dose of her inhaled steroids, it went up to 1.57, right? Uh, now, I must confess that every time she came up to the hospital, she had retraining of her inhaler spacer device. And I think technical issues were part of the uh, problem. And she, she was getting used to her inhalers and spacers. So we have a patient who is reasonably well controlled on 3,200 to 3,600 inhaled budesonide with Lama Laba. But the moment you try and decrease her to 1,600, which is a sort of the upper limit of where you would be comfortable with the patient, she drops her FEV1. So this, this is the patient. Now, I followed up, on, I've not changed her inhaled steroid level at all. 25th November, last time I saw her, her FEV1 is 1.9, 110% of predicted. So she's dramatically respond to proper training with inhaler spaces, which is, I must underscore that point because previously she had no idea how important technique was. Uh, but at a level of inhaled steroids where one isn't very comfortable persisting long term with this patient. So what are the options? That's, that's, that's the whole point. So I would categorize her as severe asthma because she's using, as we saw, high dose inhaled steroids. We managed to get her of the oral corticosteroids, but this is not a comfortable situation. And uh, let's look at what happens. Um, this is 2021, a respiration review. So almost... 20% of people 
uh, only 20% of people will have good technique as well as they take their medications. The two are separate axes of uh, um, therapy, which is not related to what you are prescribing. So adherence and good inhaler technique is only there in 20%. This is from a huge database in Netherlands where every patient is uh, registered, as you know. And almost 30% were adherent but had poor inhaler spacer technique. I think this was an element in our patient initially, uh, which is one of the reasons why she was requiring inhaled starts. And about 50% are non-adherent. So calling these people severe is actually right but they, it doesn't help if you try, try thinking of changing therapy, if you focus on the issues which are causing them to be severe. For example, almost two out of three patients with asthma who die uh, have, uh, have been shown to have not using the inhaled steroids in the past three months. So they are severe, they are dying from it, but they don't really require pharmacological interventions. They need more psychological and systematic and operational interventions. So once we are sure that the patient is adherent and has good inhaler spacer technique, then you start thinking of the newer things. This is similarly is showed in uh, uh, Gina, where only 3.7% of people are thought to have asthma from the original cohort of say 100%. Difficult to treat is a uh, uh, sort of a euphemism for that uh, lack of adherence and poor inhaler technique. So, if you take, if you see a hundred, you should probably have about four or five patients who are real severe asthma and not just not using or unable to use their inhalers. So what happens? Why don't I just stick with 3,600? So what? The patient is fine. Why, why do I need to do anything at all? I mean, she's got more super normal lung capacity now. So uh, 5,000 micrograms of Budesonide equals 10 milligrams. This is all, all uh, statistical, but this is the uh, best available data. And 1,000 equals two, that's the sort of rule of thumb. So I'm effectively giving her equivalent of about seven milligrams of oral prednisolone in the way of side effects, not efficacy. Efficacy wise, it's much more than that. But um, so it's not a very comfort, seven, 7.5 daily we have used in rheumatoid arthritis. And if there were no other options, I would continue with this but there are options. So we, we need to consider that this is not absolutely safe. So if you're talking about efficacy, about two thirds, 60% of um, effect of reducing oral corticosteroids is because the patient actually ingests the inhaled high dose corticosteroids. So systemic Absorption is part of the deal. Only 40% is because of the better uh, pharmacokinetics and di dynamics of inhaled steroids. So that suggests that I really should be considering that I have put this patient of equivalent of five to six milligrams of prednisolone a day, which I wouldn't want to do. So let's look at what the PRS ATS 2021 guidelines, 2020 guidelines say. So this is is this severe uncontrolled asthma with an eosinophilic phenotype or severe corticosteroid dependent asthma? I'd say it's severe corticosteroid dependent asthma. It's not uncontrolled, but you are giving very high dose. And our anti IL 5 is conditionally suggested. Uh, blood eosinophil cutoff 150. Our patient had more than that. And uh, so you can give IL-5 to this patient, technically. Um, IgE-260, uh, uh, anti-IgE, that is omalizumab, uh, greater than 260, she fits this criteria. Now, uh, if you um, remember the, the gu guidelines regarding omalizumab, the IgE levels are between 200 to 700, in which it is recommended. Uh, you can use it in higher levels of IgE, but our patient doesn't fit the criteria of omalizumab. Also, she's not an allergic phenotype. She's not, not had any allergies for, you know, like uh, 50 years. And certainly I would not put omalizumab as the first choice of biologics, should I use biologics. I haven't done pheno. The reason is that her FUE1 has given me enough, uh, um, let's say, ammunition to decide on 
how much inhaled steroids to do. But that's probably something which will change in the future. We, we, I will talk about that in a second. Um, uh, they recommend addition of tiotropium, which I've already done. Macrolide. Now, macrolides are a bit difficult because uh, uh, the, the, uh, it does decrease number of exacerbations, but there is no fine tuning based on IgE or eosinophil or even uh, number of exacerbations here. So if this patient doesn't have any exacerbations, then she does not require macrolides because that's the only ro uh, role of macrolides. It decreases number of exacerbations in here. So effectively, I have put that on the back burner for the moment that if she keeps on getting exacerbations, uh, then we will give her uh, azithromycin, particularly as I'm planning to at some stage try and decrease her inhaled steroids once more. Um, Dupilumab, which is an uh, IL-413 uh, 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 inhibitor. The interesting thing we will discuss this again a little in another slide is that regardless of eosinophil levels, it can decrease oral corticosteroids and exacerbations. So this is something you can use in patients who you think have asthma, but don't necessarily have a high eosinophil level. It does work better in people with eosinophilia, but th this is the current uh, status of uh, monoclonal antibodies. Um, ERS ATS guidelines. Now, a slightly more um, sort of uh, categorical study is looking at blood eosinophils. Less than 150, if pheno is greater, you can try dupilumumab. If it's less than 25, and 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 uh, sorry. and it's less than 25, you can try omalizumab. Uh, obviously, with uh, with uh, some uh, degree of variability, 150 to 1500. Basically, if there's a, we can get uh, dupilumab or IL-5, the various sorts of IL-5 inhibitors, and uh, greater than 1500, it is IL-5 which is recommended, and OCS-dependent asthma, the OT, uh, irrespective of eosinophils. You will have to give dupilumab. That's the that's the general current thought on these things. So eosinophil levels in the blood are uh, the most important in deciding what to do. Secondarily, you can use pheno and also IgE levels to to decide on what what uh, sort of biologics you would use. But uh, as uh, we showed, it is most important to look at the operational and systematic approach to inhales. Um, inhaler techniques and adherence, and perhaps keeping a close um, eye on this. Now, remember, we thought that this patient may have ABPA. We, we are not 100%, but it is a possibility. Mild bronchiectasis and uh, Ig against Aspergillus with eosinophilia. Uh, and there are case series, but not good literature, which shows that you can use um, omalizumab and mepolizumab and even a couple of patients with dupilumab. But the the data is scarce, so that, that is something which we will need to consider should we try and give biologics to this patient. Now, the other thing is uh, you will get patients where one biologic doesn't, we've had several where omelizumab has failed. Uh, there is a suggestion, particularly if they fill, uh, fulfill multiple criteria in eosinophilia and IgE, that you can sequentially try other things, particularly dupilumab seems to be uh, very useful in these situations because it does not directly affect eosinophils, which both the IL-5 and the IL-5 receptor blockers do. And uh, so that is, that is a, a, a sequential use of thing in really refractory patients would be what we would like to do. So plan of action. I'm going to try and reduce the ICS to 1600 microprions per day, which as we showed is the sort of ceiling in which one can one would be um, not uncomfortable in, in uh, following up the patient with close monitoring of PFT. Here, if I'm not sure, I will do pheno uh, because pheno will tell us that, okay, this is not working and it's getting up. If at this stage there is, there is some worsening, I would like to try azithromycin or add on azithromycin to a treatment. Uh, unfortunately, this lady had a little bit of problem with chronic diarrhea with when she was on azithromycin when she came to us, but she had some well irritable bowel syndrome sy symptoms, so that was the thing. Uh, if we can't go down to 1600, I will try mepolizumab for the reasons I've discussed. 
and then move on to dupilumab if mepolizumab fails. So my target here is stable asthma with preserved lung function at or below 1600 microgram of budesonide per day with LABA and LAMA and Montelukast and the others we, we talked about. If we fail to do that, then I'll try azithromycin, wait for a bit, give mepolizumab, wait for a bit, if unstable, consider dupilumab. Now, this is one patient, so we will have all sorts of other patients. I, I, I leave it to uh, Dr. Shakar uh, Ojada to, to comment and, you know, sort of discuss these things. Thank you, Sumit. Uh, very excellent case and probably eye opener that we can go beyond 16 microgram in certain cases. But few things uh, came in my mind. If you go by the guideline, they are saying that uh, any asthma should be treated not on the basis of just clinical, clinical findings. You have to do some thing like uh, peripheral eosinophil count, or sputum eosinophil count, and other biomarkers if possible. But uh, regarding biomarkers, there are many questions, uh, particularly for PENO. And, uh, but one thing one has to do is eosinophil count. Uh, and uh, probably your patient had been on high dose of steroid, so that's, that's right. why we haven't got, got any eosinophil count because I couldn't. No, uh, initially when when he when she came, a eosinophil count was seven ninety two. Seven ninety two. So, uh, so it was yeah, yeah. that was in the first slide, and uh, mm -hmm. Ig was on the lowest side at about one ninety. The okay. Ig went up more than seven hundred uh, once so, we took her off so the oral steroids. The phenotype we have got so far, you know, in uh, uh, different journals and particularly in up to date, they have classified five types of phenotypes, but it doesn't fit with any particular phenotype. So that's why what I was thinking that whatever we are reading in the journal or in the, you know, papers or books, textbook, sometimes you do have patients who really doesn't fit with that. And you have to uh, innovate some kind of treatment and uh, to get the best benefit and least side effect. That is perhaps one of the example of this case that uh, thank you that you have presented a very good case, but I could find that there are a lot of questions are coming up. I, I just few of them regarding biomarkers or well, somebody has raised questions about biomarkers. So Dr. Indronil Haldar, could you just highlight about the present situation of biomarkers? So uh, in fact, we are, I'll be answering both the questions simultaneously which uh, Dr. Shurajit Das has raised. So what are the biomarkers? Do you evaluate in your severe asthma patient? In fact, the simplest way to do that, it should be the eosinophil count. In fact, if facilities are there, sputum eosinophil, or blood eosinophil if there is not there, Ig level and pheno, maybe the biomarkers by which we can select what biologics we'll be using. So these are the very simplest and not that clumbersome. And in fact, to answer the second part of the question is sputum eosinophil part of the overall work of severe asthma patient. Ideally, it should be yes. Uh, and there are centers here in West Bengal also where Dr. Angira Dasgupta is also doing about the sputum eosinophil as part of the workup for severe asthma, if you go by guidelines, the GINA also tells us to, to do these uh, phenotyping through sputum eosinophil. But unfortunately, we don't have setups or lab to do this sputum eosinophil. And we go by the blood eosinophil level, though in most of the cases, it do correlates, but in some, it may not. So if we don't have, then we can think of the blood eosinophil and a count of more than uh, 150 may be taken as high blood eosinophil level, and we can think of multiple episodes of uh, multiple say, settings where we can see the blood eosinophil level to be high and then go for thinking that the patient is having blood eosinophil level. So probably blood eosinophil and Ig may both of them uh, together tell us what biologics can we use in our setup where we have at least three biologics available in the market. So with the anything that you will be adding because you were recently talking about the biologics, just uh, one question has been raised by Partho that uh, uh, in this eosinophilic, high eosinophilic asthma, what agent, meporizumab or benlarizumab? So Sumit, what is your opinion about these two molecules? One is 
monoclonal uh, antibody against interleukin 5, another is receptor. The antibody on the receptor, it's on the molecule. So, is there uh, a difference? I'll uh, come to that in a second, Ajay. Let me uh, complete this discussion about the biomarkers. Mm -hmm. See, uh, uh, there is a bit of a uh, problem with sputum eosinophil. Actually, uh, analysis has shown that it isn't very good because of the problem of uh, analyzing or the standardization of treatment. So actually, ERS, ATS, as well as NICE, do not recommend it as a routine tool to assess asthma control. Uh, they are focusing on things which are simple to do in the population, which is pheno and blood eosinophil. The, uh, the emphasis is on repeated uh, testing as we showed in our patient. And if you have access to a good lab, which does put in eosinophil, you, you, you should use it, but you need to understand there is no certain level where it is confirmed or guideline based where you can change your treatment. So sputum eosinophil, more than seven, no guidelines. More than five, what is the guideline? So it has to be in a very specialized setting where you have access to a very good lab. So pheno and uh, uh, your uh, uh, blood eosinophil levels are the, and repeated testing of that in with a specific question in mind. You don't just ask, how bad is my asthma patient? You want to do something clinically and you will look at it and say, if it is more than this, I'll do it. Only then these, these make a difference. So, so if me, my... Uh, so me just uh, uh, one point I'd like to add. The up-to-date journal has mentioned both the pheno and the uh, eosinophil according to guideline, but they have commented that probably high eosinophil count is good enough you don't have to go for pheno in each and every case. Yes, as you see, I, ha yeah. I haven't done yeah. pheno. Yeah. I think pheno is very important when you're trying to decrease inhaled steroids because yeah. then you don't want the patient three weeks down the line to come in with an acute attack where the pheno would have picked up that his inflammation is going up. You shouldn't actually decrease. So, I, uh, uh, you know, you have to have some clinical outcome in mind that mm -hmm. I am going to decrease it, I'll monitor something. If it goes before the patient gets worse, I can re readjust my treatment. Yeah. Uh, for um, eosinophil counts, again, multiple tests are, are uh, suggested as we showed in this patient that the eosinophil count went up substantially after uh, we decreased oral steroids. About the mepolizumab and ben benralizumab, uh, unfortunately, I don't have that much experience to give personal experience in this. But uh, they are equivalent in decreasing um, uh, attacks, severe asthma attacks. Uh, there is a little bit of a question about benralizumab because uh, they actually decrease eosinophils too much. The, the eosinophils become very, very, uh, they actually become zero because uh, what they do is, uh, this, it's an uh, IL-4 receptor uh, um, uh, and it binds to that receptor and it instigates the natural killer cells to get rid of the cells bearing the IL-4 receptors. So actually destroy eosinophil producing cells and they have dramatically decrease the, the eosinophils, but nobody's really sure whether zero eosinophils is a good idea, what happens in the longer term with parasitic and other inflammations. So uh, the the length of time that mepolizumab has been there is, uh, um, and the data from it is more robust. Though technically, looking at the data available, there is no not much difference in, in use. You can use either. I suspect benralizumab is also much more expensive, but uh, I haven't had really any good experience of that. So I would go with mepolizumab, and as I said, we can try sequentially to see if others work, and a different sort of not uh, um, mono. Um, Antibodies not affecting eosinophil, but some other uh, mechanisms like IL-413, uh, that, that, like the dupilumab, would be a sequential um, good um, approach, in my opinion. So, yes, Sumitra, uh, yes. Dr. Shakar, can I just add? Yeah, yeah. When it comes to mepalizumab versus benralizumab, in fact, as Dr. Uh, Sumitra has already highlighted, that, in fact, so much robust data are not there, but yes, benralizumab do produce the eosinophil to zero, the target being to zero eosinophil. We are practically, we are really scared. What will we do? But another advantage of mepalizumab is there because of the frequency of dosage. So it can be given at two monthly interval in the after the first dose. In fact, that is also one advantage what we can get. 
the frequency of doses that also practically will help us in uh, it may be in that way uh, the frequency is less in so that the patient acceptance may be better in that way just uh, coming to that high dose super high dose i would say with 32 microgram of budesonide uh, inhaled corticosteroid, which is equivalent to 7.5 milligram of prednisolone. Uh, just I was wondering if we uh, had have to continue that amount of those for months together, is that going to suppress our adrenal? Yes, yes, that's that's exactly what that uh, study showed. That, that is the reason I'm concerned. Otherwise, the patient is fantastic. You know, he's taking inhalers, the lung capacity has never been as good as this. The problem is that, you know, it is an oral steroid equivalent of 7.5 to 10. So uh, that is the way where uh, the problem lies. And that is why I'm thinking of, I'll try again to decrease it. Should, should we decrease it? If it doesn't work, then what's the plan? And that, that these are the things I've thought of. Uh, Partho has raised one question about that repeat of PFT and uh, regarding fast case. Um, was yes. there any reason you have asked this question, Parto? See, uh, the thing is that the patient already developed some uh, fixed airway obstruction. And that's the reason would practically, Parto has asked whether the fixed airway obstruction uh, was there or not, was, or there was an improvement in the FEV1 after the steroid therapy. In fact, there was a slight increase in the FEV1 after the steroid, oral steroid therapy but it was to the tune, it was 43% or something in the initial phase, it went up to 57% uh, or something after treatment with oral steroid. That's the thing. Okay. Whether the part subject developed fixed airway obstruction or not, probably that was the real thing that we wanted to see in this patient. Yeah. Uh, there is a question here, Ajayda, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, the validity of eosinophils in India, where you have a lot of parasitic. Uh, yeah, I, I could remember. Uh, and I, I think that it's a very valid question, uh, but it's easily sorted. I mean, you, you could easily give the patient antiparasitics and repeat the eosinophil count after three, four weeks or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, it is not just the eosinophils. You've diagnosed severe asthma, and then you're like, trying to look at a marker of that. So in that case, if you're worried, you can give the patient albendazole or, or even ivermectin one dose uh, and then repeat it up three weeks to make sure you're not, you know, uh, falsely uh, allocating the patient. Uh, so many, to, to... In our practice, we have been seeing so many cases other than asthma. How many of them had a eosinophil count that very high? I think it's more theoretical, you know, uh, in our uh, college life we used to read, but now no, I, 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 I that... suspect also that it depends on the socioeconomic strata of yeah. the patients you see. That's but, so but I think in the, the medical uh, colleges, you will find a lot of people uh, with eosinophil. So, so what I think is that persistently high, more than say 300, it is unlikely that the patient is suffering from helminthic infection rather than we can think of some other uh, high use. But if you're worried, you can, you, you can just as well treat yeah, the patient. Can, it's not a big deal. It's not yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Any other questions actually? Oh, yes, know. one, one uh, question is there. So in I'm first case, should we can, uh, why can't it be topical pulmonary eosinophilia and why there was not a therapeutic trial with diethyl carbamazepine? In fact, that is what is practice. In fact, in the periphery, the patient comes to the pulmonologist or a hematologist. What happens is that physician periphery should find blood eosinophilia, what they randomly do is prescribe diethyl carbamazepine. That is something which they already have taken. So the question, practically, what the message should go, should all patients of eosinophil get a therapeutic trial of dilethyl carbamazepine? Is one question. Another is, can my case be a topical pulmonary eosinophilia? To answer the second part first, so without any pulmonary infiltrates and this high blood eosinophil, and in fact, I told that antigen for uh, the phylodial antigen is negative. Practically, we didn't suspect topical pulmonary eosinophilia. And to answer the second question, which I think all of our uh, panelists and uh, Dr. Shortkar should also so, take part in this. Should the I tell Dr. Indonesia, in Indonesia, just uh, regarding this tropical hyper eosinophilia, I have got a very question, big question mark. So when you have an infiltration, when you have high eosinophil count, why not it's a eosinophilic syndrome involving the lung only? Uh, because we know that organ involvement varies from patient to patient. And there, what is tropical? 
I, I don't understand. This has been going on in our uh, medical education, but uh, after that, mm -hmm. I don't find this entity existing now. Tropical. Well, uh, uh, the no, other no, thing no. which uh, um, this rules out tropical pulmonary eosinophilia is an Ig less than thousand. That's, Absolutely. that's a diagnostic uh -huh. mandatory criteria for tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. So, so another, pulmonary... another thing is that that the, the question that arises is should we benefit of doubt? Should we give diethyl coronavirus? My answer should be no. Unless we think of tropical pulmonary eosinophilia or phyllidiasis, diethyl coronavirus should not be given for all patients of eosinophilia. That's the thing. No, the, uh, the tropical pulmonary eosinophilia is coined because it was uh, initially uh, uh, forwarded from the tropics from India, and one group at uh, ACPGI uh, Lucknow has been doing uh, quite extensive research on this uh, item, and they are finding quite a good number of cases, and they have framed a diagnostic um, criteria uh -huh. for tropical pulmonary eosinophilia afresh. So I think uh, this is uh, going to be rejuvenated soon. So this is about tropical, and there is one question by Dr. Ghosh regarding IL-33 um, uh, <clears throat> antibody to IL-33. That's uh, I, if there's anybody to answer about the monoclonal antibodies IL-33 against IL-33 and its role in eosinophilic asthma, because we know IL-33 is also a very key leukotriene so in the process of um, TH2-induced asthma. Type asthma. I, I'm afraid I don't have any information specific to that, but there are about 13 other monoclonals, and it will take years for the, any mm -hmm. evidence for that to come through. I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, interest in this, but I, I personally don't have any knowledge. Yeah. That. Thank you. My voice is betraying, but uh, Dr. Hosh has referred to a particular um, ITP key map. And he has given a reference. Yes, anyway. They're all, all in trials. There's about another 13 molecules which we looked at. So I don't think that uh, really right at this moment, you know, uh, the first trial for mepolizumab came out in 2012. So it will take about another nine years for all of these to come through, um, particularly as they are not the first kids on the block. But uh, we will keep our eyes open if there's something comes up which is uh, uh, worth its... Um, um, uh, is scientifically proven, we certainly consider that. There are a load of other, uh, a huge cocktail of uh, uh, interleukins which can be blocked in asthma and neosmophilia. Any other questions? So someone has asked about the immunocap method and allergy skin prick testing. So yes, uh, allergy skin prick testing is the gold standard when we think of uh, picking up allerg uh, allergic sensitivity or something. And if someone cannot do a skin prick test, we can go for the blood specific Ig by the immunocap method. And that should be only by the immunocap method and no, not by any other method when we think of a specific Ig level. I think that is the best method of estimating Ig. Immunocap? Yeah. When I, uh, be, uh, before uh, skin prick testing, you think of? Skin prick could be the screening test. And my conception goes that it uh, detects uh, antigen from three-dimensional uh, sense. So it is possibly much more effective and precise to measure a particular allergen. I may be wrong. This is my concept. So that means you want to tell that the skin prick test, we can say test say 40 or 30, 45 antigen. Yeah. And if we think that these are the specific thing, we can go for an immunocap method for five big, knowing fully well that immunocap is costlier uh, test in that yeah, way. Yeah, it's costlier, but if you're objective for a precise diagnosis of an allergen, immunocap is a gold standard. This is my concept. I do not know whether other uh, uh, experts will agree to me. Should I think we... the problem with skin prick testing is a uh, lack of standardized antigens. Uh, immunocap yes. is, is standardized I, I worldwide. Like so you can compare uh, compare with anywhere in the world. Right. So that And also uh, the problem with skin prick is often operational again. Uh, people are not really trained to do skin prick testing and they do uh, a lot of not... different things which are not helpful. They use needles, uh, which is absolutely banned in uh, skin prick testing. Um, I've never seen anybody use a lancet here. So uh, that's a dis discussion for a different uh, uh, place. But uh, I think I would stick with immunocap because it's, uh, you know, standardized. Let's put it that way. 
well standardized but still what the textbook are telling right now at least that's the aja sumitha another question which has been raised can we give mepalizumab in failure of banalizumab uh, banalizumab failure can we give mepalizumab or otherwise vice versa in mepalizumab failure can we give banalizumab i am sure you can but the data for us to give a coherent sort of uh, guidelines or recommendation is lacking as i showed you there is some evidence that there is a differential effect so it's not that all of them work the same so it is well proven for omalizumab failures and mepalizumab work and as we said benalizumab has got a very very high potency to decrease eosinophil so it might work in mepalizumab failures but uh, and dupilumab is uh, attractive because it works through a different mechanism so so all these things you have to consider i think the main problem here is the cost i mean if it was like a, a inhaled steroid changing the uh, variety we would have tried a lot of things but here even getting somebody to give 6 months of treatment with one monoclonal is is uh, prohibitive so let's see the prices should come down and hopefully we'll be able to use this a lot more right if there is no more questions then i like to thank both the speaker and also those who have participated and have joined with their beautiful questions and uh, we have discussed this the summary of this uh, <clears throat> webinar is that severe asthma we are getting every day in our day to day practice and uh, sometimes we are trying with high dose of steroid but not to the extent of 32 microgram which perhaps we can try in our patient but problem lies with the duration of treatment obviously we can't continue them if you need to have uh, other medications in your armamentarium we have discussed those things but i don't have any experience and my co speaker also uh express their opinion that we don't have much experience but obviously these are the options available right now they are costly treatment but life is more costlier than medicine so one can try that and uh, i'm sure the asthma treatment in the treatment line there has been lot of research going on and new molecules are coming up and uh, the era of antibody is going on in every sphere of medicine so obviously we'll have more and more antibodies in di for different markers and also biomarkers we'll get more biomarkers in future so and we have to learn those things day by day by aggregating those medicines but i in i'm a very conservative person and uh, i don't experience those molecules in the first place unless i really see that they are getting better in with these few words i like to thank again everyone and all i must thank uh, partho for organizing such a beautiful conference in this way and uh, really we are enjoying even as a uh, moderator i have learned few things i must admit so that is the way you know science progress you have to learn every day thank you everybody so thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you ajayda thank you uh, dr sumit and indranil for your uh, contribution to our uh, today's module of palmacon 2021 i'm thankful to all the audience and uh, i wish next week to see you again on another topic next sunday at 7 pm thank you very thank much you, so thank you, you. there was a very lively thank session i have also learned a lot but i am still confused i not <laughs> yet so one question was unanswered i, I can understand a lot many things i understand one question see, practically I, it was a good question there is phenol <clears> a good biomarker <throat> and does it correlate with the eosinophilic phenotype of severe asthma sumitha your comment on that pheno uh, pheno is a good biomarker see the problem with eosinophilic phenotype is that mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it, there is no direct correlation like you can't say that uh, 50 increase in serum eosinophils means pheno will go up by x the uh, the attraction of pheno is it is non invasive it's available not very expensive though more expensive than serum eosinophils uh, but also it directly measures airways so that is something which uh, uh, blood doesn't uh, blood eosinophil doesn't give us but practically speaking till date i think what i've uh, understood and what i've learned 
is that you use pheno to de-escalate treatment and otherwise the clinical yeah, you control the patient then you start thinking am i giving too much steroids can i decrease it so Let's no, decrease no, my next question should be why didn't you do a pheno for your patient uh, why should i why why what what, what what would you have done if we said if you know less than 25 hole ki korte more than 25 hole ki korte yes there is no that's what i am asking you don't do a test without asking the question first so i i thought about it twice uh, hospitalization shomoy kori na acute e korte hoy na acute no, gives you a long, 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 long. when the patient but later on we were planning to do it but she responded so dramatically because the pft was telling me everything that you know just ek to inhale start komale urur kore spirometric kome jacche abar bari dile kome jacche phino to ami ki korbo oi toi to korbo acha next Ebar, next question uh, sumit da which we already practically don't know whether we are in still in recording mode or not so, wouldn't when it uh, if the patient could have afford afforded would you give a biologics for your patient i'd actually plan for a biologic and what Second, biologic would it be a mepolizumab or a berenalizumab in your patient i would plan for mepolizumab but uh, because the patient improved so dramatically or second pft the 1.53 82% hoye gelo everyone how do you justify giving mepolizumab to somebody like that i will abba eto hoye gelo bole komalam jokhon tokhon abar jhar hoye gelo tale eta na difficult to asthma pote pollo ki thale tomar definition ki difficult to asthma ha high dose uh, ics yeah, more than high dose ics lagche to keep the control so that is not difficult it is severe asthma because the the concept is oral corticosteroids or high dose required to keep the patient control so sei ta to pore jacche ebare if i can't decrease it to 1600 i will give mepolizumab as it from my center i am not very convinced but i probably will try it before mepolizumab it's a much cheaper uh, alternative so acha ar ar ekta je amar case er sambandhe tomar kichu prashno chilo jeta practically amar case ki bolhi eta my case basically i got mane help from ongira and i'm thankful to ongira amar bola uchit chilo prothome पड़े <laughs> so that is that can itself whatever be the cause cause huge damage amar to tai mone je eta hyperisomeric syndrome of endorgen ta hote gele to hobe kintu endorgen hote hobe sob somewhere na ek din eosinophil bhalo por din to ar heart e effect korbe na na hoto you have to be very careful koto koto 3 mash na 9 mash age re 6 mash er o beshi mane in fact last 2 years dhore or eosinophil count beshi are ke tumi ke ye debe na keno anti ipolizumab mepolizumab छोट बेला or eosinophil high eosinophil with all features of asthma bone marrow bolche na je hyper eosinophilic syndrome or eosinophilic leukemia this patient probably should be a candidate of mepolizumab or bendalizumab in fact bendalizumab dile to aro bhalo or ekdom zero very odd jeta ache je tomar steroid e khub bhalo response hocche na which is very odd oral steroid clonal abnormality chhara baki gulo usually to oral steroid e to dramatic response ebong ei patient ta je clonal noy tar praman hocche bone marrow bone marrow to pulled out that's fair na ha tobe ami jani na single bone marrow kora hoyechilo ekbar kora hoyechilo i should you repeat the bone marrow after say few months or few years eta ekta slide gulo review kora that time bone marrow is good enough to rule out clonal tomar to peripheral high count hoyeche ekdom मन हम स्लो रिव्यू कर 
क्लियर আমার সবথেকে বেশি অসুবিধা ওইটা বুঝতে যে আমি কেন দিচ্ছি আমি এখন অবধি ইওসিনফিল বেশি মেপো দিয়ে দেব কি বেনারিজমাব দিয়ে দেব এই তো লেখা আছে সবাই করছে বাট আই আই ডোন্ট ফিল কমফোর্টেবল এট অল উইথ দা এক্সপ্লেনেশনস আই ফিল ইট শুড বি মাচ মোর প্রিসাইজ এন্ড কনসেপচুয়ালি অ্যাকসেপ্টেবল কেন তো আমরা এইখানে তুমি করতে পারবে তোমার একটা ইনস্টিটিউট আছে আমরা এই আইএল 6 এই কোভিড এর বাইরে উইদিন 1 মান্থ অল হসপিটালস ইন ক্যালকাটা যারা জীবনে আইএল 6 বানানো করতে পারে না তারা কিন্তু টেস্ট করতে শুরু করে দিয়েছে আরে হসপিটালস কেন তো দা টেকনোলজি টু ডু দা টেস্ট ইজ নট ইট ফর নার্সিং হোমস ফেরিটাল নার্সিং হোমস অসো হ্যাঁ না ওটা তো এবারে এইগুলো একটা একটু যদি তুমি একটা সায়েন্টিফিক গ্রান্ট পাও ইউ কুড ডু সাম ইন্টারলিউকিং স্টাডিজ ইন ইচ্ছা আছে আমার মনে এটা নিয়ে আমার একটু ব্রেনস্টর্মিং করার ইচ্ছা আছে এটা ইজিলি করা যাবে কারণ আমাদের কলকাতায় চেনাশোনার মধ্যে অ্যাট লিস্ট তুমি 100 টা پیشنট কালকেই পেয়ে যাবে जिजेस probably they were well responding they were very responding good responding ami jani na keno ami mane ekta jinish hote pare je amra khub high dose steroid failure chilo ha steroid exactly mone porche na but high dose of steroid mane we have tried everything with those patients tara oi steroid failure e diyechi ami ami eta ani ami eta clinical trial e dhukechilam ei e parto da kintu ekhon oneke shunche people are I mean, questioning. We are under, not understanding Bengali. If you are still discussing, oh, let oh, us understand. Discussing English. <laughs> people are telling that we are miscommunicating no, English. No, we can we can talk communicate in English because people so want is, to learn. This is this chit chat beyond the beyond the discussion topic, but still it is something very good to hear. So let us discuss in English so that everyone can understand. <clears throat> sure. So I have given it to only one patient, Omalizuma, with all possible all indications because he was a part of a trial. and um, the patient uh, was uh, improved borderline not much and i am not very convinced uh, from that single yes. patient experience so after that i didn't give and to me 5% uh, i mean hardly i mean, i don't believe that 5% of the total asthma load is actually severe asthma because i don't find severe asthma that way once the patient comes to me after my algorithm of approach that refractory difficult to treat patients uh, they are very very small in number that's very much, interesting because much, i much haven't put fault. any patient parthoda i agree yeah. with you i haven't put any patient in the last 20 years on oral corticosteroids for asthma not a single one but again so maybe that i'm using high dose inhaled steroids higher dose but i have not and uh, i don't know maybe uh, white caucasians have a different thing i have patients with recurrent exacerbation that's true so um, but uh, requiring oral corticosteroids no I have no, just so much you emphasize here also we are talking about maintenance because during exacerbation you are giving steroid no no that is a different thing i am saying chronic steroid maintenance steroid oral steroid so no. should we no, no. again there are patients of asthma long time asthma now has developed fixed, fixed air flow obstruction patients now poorly control but when they are given an ultra lava ultra lama knowing asthma but the fixed airway fev1 is very less this patient again responds very well to this ultra lava ultra lama and they are symptomatically better yes, is we right talking about the copd phenotype uh, so, chronic, no, 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 not, not copd phenotype not copd i have an answer see uh, 
this I have learned after starting glycopyronium. And I have got a, I started a test, glycopyronium reversibility test, where I give glycopyronium 50 mics through dry powder inhaler and check the FEV1 reversibility after 30 minutes. So it takes a little time, but a lot of patients respond. And what I feel that fixed airway obstruction is a wrong term. There's a pseudo fix and true fix. True fixed mm -hmm. is a remodeled airway and pseudo fix is continuously overtone, continuous overtone of the muscularis where the lumen is narrowed. Otherwise you cannot explain that reversibility. That reversibility sometimes is quite huge, maybe 300 ml. And That's it happens good. both in asthma and COPD. And interestingly, the, the muscarinic receptors are supposed to be much sparse in the distal airways. But if you look at the report, you can see that the small airway improvement in terms of FEF 2575 is far better at times. So uh, that is a basic, you know. Um, no, that that is true. I mean, in <clears throat> particular in the elderly patients, uh, fanta I always uh, almost you don't have to wait for severe asthma. I give all of them uh, uh, anti. Glycopyridium. No, I, uh, I've got tritropium. Glycopyridium to inhaler. Glycopyridium is far better than tritropium. This is my experience. I think so. I mean, uh, no, no, you can so, just according. Yeah. You, you try. In fact, that means part of that you're using glycopyridium yeah. formidable combination. Most of the time. Yes. And dry powder. I mean, dry powder or PMDI? Dry powder, inhaler also. So I, I, fully, I fully agree with Partho. That is yes. also my perception. It's much better than Tartu. Yeah, it's better than So we have a question. For your case, uh, if you would have done uh, repeated pheno, would it, wouldn't it have been better to understand what's going on? You are hiking the inhaled dose, you are reducing it. I, initially, but she got so much better. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it was a little more but uh, long term, I will do it. The next step I'm going to do is get the pheno when stable on 3200. Then, every two weeks, I will do it. There was a question which we didn't answer practically. I now see that ultrafine particle, ultrafine uh, beclomethazone or budesonide, is there a better choice when you are seeing that the patient is not controlled because they reach the small airways? That's true. Uh, no. There is no scientific evidence that the dose is less than the dose. So, if you have better deposition, you have less dose. The equivalent dose, equipotent doses, the dose is less than the dose. So, it's a, you know, it's a false um, improvement. If you have an ultrafine particle, you have to give it to the and not ultrafine, ultrafine. It's almost half level. You do to aki kaj karakota. Beclometason equals budesonide. Standard to the same particle. The other point here yeah. is mentioned yeah. that yeah. penetrate small airways better than your normal inhalers. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 disease, uh, all that, even nebulized bronchodilator does not reach. Yeah, I can find it out because I have record of these patients. Those who had a predominant small airway problem, I had given this ultra fine. Nebuli, nebuli. Yeah, yeah, nebuli, but uh, I have to check my records. It is, uh, it is a time, uh, <laughs> it can be done at my place, but let's see if I find the opportunity somewhere, sometimes. But it had been a very interesting discussion today. I, I enjoyed thoroughly. I enjoyed too. Uh, good, good. Thank you. Any of you have any, any place where you can buy biologics for cheap? I will try. No, no, you, no, I'm you telling you, biologics, biology. will come. biologics will come cheaper when the patency is gone and some Indian pharmaceutical house start manufacturing. I don't know. It may be. Sipla no. <laughs> Then you already reliance by manufacturing omelism of so it is, I do not know how cheap it is. So, but uh, yeah, it is possible. But until the perception, conception about indication of biologies gets clear, it I will be a little reserved to use it. I think yeah. there are multiple, Indaka. multiple, Shumitri, multiple Indaka. Indaka. Yes. for information. If you block one, the other limb will be much stronger. Other problem so, is you... Paralysis of one limb, your other limb will work far stronger. Partho, if that drug becomes cheaper, then you'll find that everybody is using that. I have already got information <laughs> that in various um, uh, premier institutes, uh, private institutes in the country, people are just coming in, nobody's looking at the inhaler spacer technique or anything. 
they, they have been giving uh, biologics right left and center and nobody knows what is the efficacy that's no the sad problem. part but there you are mm, that's the problem okay so we can leave now huh? thank you parthodar thank, 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 thank you 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 thank ठीक है